I'd be ashamed to look to look people in the eye. Everyone in the settlement is laying foundation for palaces, and the one and only Chai is living in a tent. Guests come, and who knows what they think of us. Knowing the little girl's way and her sensitivity to any kind of charity, they assign me to negotiate with her about building a house. I went to see her and said, Sonia, at an assembly, the people of our settlement decided to build you a little house. You just tell us where to put it. She asked me rather guardly, Uncle Colia, how much will a small house cost? Suspecting nothing, I replied, 200000 more or less, 2000 per family. 2000 but that's, But that's a great deal of money. That means people will buy less for their own children. They'll be spending money on me. Uncle Colia, I, I beg of you, tell the people I don't need a house yet. I still haven't even decided where to put it. I beg you, Uncle Colia, explain it to the people, please. She was upset, and I understood why. Having been giving her own Hector, Sonia felt independent for the first time in her life. It took the place of parents for her. It needed her, and she, and she it. By some inner instinct, the girl felt and imagined that her land wouldn't want a stranger to touch it. And God forbid anyone should reproach her after the house was built, even with a silent reproach to Sonia. Her own independence, independence was more precious to her than a house of her own. I began trying to persuade them not to force any gifts on the girl. And soon after, something unexpected happened. Children ran from the lake past Sonia's parcel and then the lead of a fancy bicycle with it was Edik, the entrepreneur's son. He was always teasing Sonia, calling her shorty, even though he himself was just three years older. Hey, shorty, Edik shouted to Sonia. Still busy with your landscape design? Aren't you tired of it? Why don't we go see the, spect the spectacle? What spectacle, Sonia asked. My papa is going to burn down this construction hut now. See over there? The fire engines already already come. Just in case. Why burn it down? Because it's spoiling the view. But after it burns, nothing will grow on the land for a long time. Why not? Because all the helpful worms and all the bugs will burn up. Look, I lit a fire near my tent, and now nothing's growing on that spot. Wow, you're very observant, Shorty. So save, your, so save our worms. Take the old trailer or else my papa won't know where to dump it. How can I take it? Isn't it heavy? How? How? With a crane, of course. There's a crane coming here the day after tomorrow to put up a windmill. Basically, take it away or that there's going to be a very grand bonfire here now. Okay, Edik, I agree to take your trailer. Let's go then. The grown-up neighbors and lots of the children had gathered by the homestead of Edik parents. The fire crew stood at the ready. Right then, Edik walked up to his father, who was walking toward the construction hut with a canister of gasoline and said, and said to the displeasure of the kids and the joyous amazement of the grown-ups, Papa, you don't have to burn down the trailer. What do you mean I don't? Why is that? Because I gave it away. Who to, Shorty? What Shorty? You know, Sonia from the last parcel. Really? She agreed? She agreed to take it from you? Papa, if you don't believe me, you can ask her yourself. Edik took Sonia by, by the hand from the midst of the crowd of children and led her to his father. Tell him you agree to take the hut. Tell him. I agree, Sonia replied, replied quietly. 
the entrepreneur couldn't hide his bursting pride in his son. This was wonderful. Willful Sonia wouldn't take anything from anyone and agreed to take a present only from his addict. When the kids had scattered, the entrepreneur called over the entire crew working on the finishing his house. And he told them, use any materials, work around the clock, I'll pay double, but I want there to be a euro, a euro apartment inside this hut in two days. The outside can be peeling, but inside. Two days later, on Sonia's parcel, next to the birch tree, on the spot where her tent had been, the peeling construction trailer had been placed on a brick foundation. It was peeling, but had been prepped by the builders for painting, and the finished paint and brushes were inside. Sonia painted it by herself later, the first house of her own in her life, standing on her own land. The next year, this house was transformed into a fairy tale cottage, intertwined with ivy and wild grapes and surrounded by blooming flower beds. Ten years passed. Sonia had graduated and had been living on her own homestead for a year. Houses has, had gone up in the settlement, which was drowning in greenery and blooming gardens. But Sonia had the very best, most beautiful plot of all. When her classmates left the children home, retreating into oblivion, trying to matriculate at some education or institute, just so it had a dormitory to find some kind of job, just so they would have enough to feed themselves, Sonia was already a wealthy person. The settlement's resident gave their excess fruits and vegetables to a manager. The crop yield from the homesteads was, was, was bought up at a fairly, fairly high price and exported to countries of the European Union. To special stores selling organic food, Sonia too gave the manager what she had raised on her homestead, although most of her produce went to people who came to her direction to came came to her directly from the city, having heard about the unusual girl in her marvelous homestead. Sonia also gathered medicinal herbs and helped cure many people of illnesses. One day Eddie came to visit his parents, who now live on their homestead year round. He had studied at a prestigious American university for three years. He faced a difficult medical operation. The overseas water and food had probably created a problem with his liver and kidneys. Before the operation, Eddick decided to spend a week with his parents. Seneda, Eddick's mother, suggested, Son, maybe we should go see our local healer. Maybe she can help. Oh, Mama, what's, what century are we living in? There in the West, medicine has long been at the highest level. The diseased tissue needs to be cut out and replaced. Don't worry, I'm not going to any of those old medicine women. That's the century before last. I'm not suggesting you go to any old woman. Remember the little girl from the children's home at the edge of our village? who to everyone's amazement herself worked the hector of land giving her? Let's go see her. You mean Shorty? I vaguely remember. She's no Shorty now, son, but a highly respected person. Managers are prepared to pay her double for what she raises with her own hand, and people come from, fair, from far away places for her herbs harvest, even though she puts out no advertising whatsoever. How does Shorty know so much? Since first grade, she was brought to her plot every summer and every winter. She read different books every day on agriculture and folk medicine. The children's mind is keen and, and absorbs everything well and absorbs everything well. She has gleaned a great deal from books, of course. Only people say she has understood more by herself. They also say she understands plants. She talks to them. How about that, Shorty? How much does she charge for treatment? Sometimes she charges, but sometimes she treats people for free. Last fall, I met her near the pond. 
she looked into my eyes and said, Auntie Zena, there's something wrong with the whites of your eyes. Take this herb, make an infusion and drink it. It will pass. And it did. The whites of my eyes really did have something wrong because my liver did. Now it doesn't come. Now it doesn't. Come, son, let's go. Maybe she will help your liver too. Only it's not just my liver, Mama. I already have a diagnosis. They're going to remove a kidney. None of your infusions are going to help here. Actually, let's go. It will be interesting to see Shorty's homestead. People say it, it's like heaven. Yes, he's done a great job. Eddick said, unable to restrain his admiration as he and his mother approached Tanya's homestead. While the people in the settlement were putting all their efforts into building houses and stone walls, she was creating a true paradise. Look at the fence. She grew from greenery, Mama. If you saw her orchard, you would admire her even more but she lets very few people into her orchard. Sanada remarked. She opened the gate slightly and called out loudly. Sanya, if you're home, come out. Sanya, are you, are you home? The door of the little house, the former construction shed, opened, and a young woman came out on the front step. With a smooth gesture, she put her tight, dark blonde braid behind her shoulder. She saw Zaneda accompanied by her son, and her cheeks flushed rosily. She buttoned the top button of her blouse, which swat her firm breast, and with a soft, light, and at the same time graceful gait, the young beauty went down the stairs and headed down the path toward the gate, where Zanada and Eddick were standing. Hello, Aunt Zanina. Hello, Auntie Zanina. Welcome, Edward. Come into my house or orchard if you like. Thank you for the invitation. We would be pleased to come in, Zanada replied. But Eddick said nothing, not even hello. You know, Sonia, Zanada continued talking on the way to the orchard. My son has a problem and he faces an, faces an operation. Although they will operate on him in America, still I'm worried as a mother. Somehow. Sonia stopped, turned, and asked Eddick, What hurts you, Edward? My heart, Eddick replied in a constrained voice. What do you mean, your heart? Zanata explained. You told me it was your liver and kidney. You mean you lied to reassure me? I didn't lie, but now my heart is pounding, Mama. Here, feel how it's pounding. He took his mother's hand and pressed it to his chest. Listen, it's going to burst if you don't convince this young beauty to marry me this instant. What a joker, Sonata laughed. You nearly frightened your mother to death. I'm not joking, Mama, Eddick replied seriously. Well, if you're not joking, Sonata continued gaily, then know that half the settlement has already sent their matchmaker to see Sonia for their sons. But all without result, she doesn't want to marry. Go ask her why she doesn't and stop misleading your mother. Eddick walk up to Sonia and ask her quietly, Sonia, why don't you want to marry anyone? Because Sonia answered quietly, because I was waiting for you, Eddick. You jokers, why are you making fun of a mother? Bless us, Mama, immediately. I'm not joking. Eddick said firmly, and he took Sonia's hand. I'm not joking either, Auntie Zena. Sonia said seriously. You're not joking? You mean you too, Sonia? Sonia, you're not joking? 
So if you're not joking, why are you calling me auntie instead of mama? Fine, I will call you mama. Sonia answered in a trembling voice and taking a step towards Zanata, she stopped in, his, in hesitation. Zanata could not make sense right away of what happened. Was it a trick, a joke? She gravely shifted her gaze from Sonia's face to her son and back again. At some point, she understood the seriousness of the young people's intentions. And when she did, she, she rushed to Sonia, embraced her, and began to weep. Weep. Sonia, dear Sonia, dear daughter, I realize you're serious. Sonia's shoulders began to tremble as she pressed close to Zanata, and she repeated, Yes, Mama, I'm serious. Yes, very serious. Then the young people took each other's hand and slowly not noticing anyone around them, started down the streets of the settlement to the homestead of Eddick's family. Ahead of them walked Sonata. She was laughing and crying simultaneously and chattering nonstop, running up to everyone she met. We arrived and right away they fell in love, and right away I blessed them. At first I thought it was a joke, but right away they fell in love. And I told them, and they said to me, a wedding mama today. Good people, how can this be? We have to prepare. It has to be official. We can't do things this way. When her husband and entrepreneur, Eddick father came out and heard approximately the same and coherent story from her, he looked at the young people and said, oh, you're always rattling on, Sonata. What does... That mean, why can't we have a wedding today? Just look at these young people. We don't need to have a wedding today. We need to, we need to right now. Eddick walked up to his father and embraced him. Thank you, Papa. Come now. Thank you. Come now. Embrace. We need to shout. It's bitter. So, so your kiss can make it sweet. It's bitter, bitter. Shouted the people who had gathered around in front of the settlement's inhabitants. Eddick and Sonia kissed for the first time. All the settlement residents who were at home at that moment gathered for the wedding. They all sat an improv improvised table in the open air together. The wedding was in rowdy, as can happen, at Russian drinking parties, but they sang late into the night. Despite the parents' attempt at persuasion, the newlyweds settled not in their place of a house, but in Sonia's small home. You have to understand, Father, Eddick said. We built a palace here with different outbuildings on half the hectares, but it doesn't have the beauty Sonia's homestead does, and we don't have the air. We should take down half of it. The entrepreneur went out to drink for a week, but to everyone's amazement, he began talking taking down the outbuilding while repeating over and over and we were fools to build this here and now our grandchildren won't want to move into catacombs like this